is Sam of Historian Explaining a Historian Tells You Why Everything You Know is Wrong. So you may know I've mentioned before a few weeks ago that I was thinking about doing another sort of year in review, putting events of the year in historical context the way I've done twice before in 2020 and 2021. But I wasn't sure if I would do it or exactly how I would go about it because events and discourse have shifted. I made those commentaries in the past two years partly because the pandemic so totally dominated our interaction and perception of the world at that moment. And I wanted to put that in perspective. But things have changed now, right? And different questions, disputes that have been kind of on the back burner have now come forward, both within the United States and on the world stage. So I was debating whether or not I should try to tackle this much more complicated sort of scene we have in front of us now. And while that was in my mind, I actually was invited on the Katie Halper Show, which is a regular podcast and commentary show by the the journalist and pundit Katie Halper. Some of that interview has been posted on YouTube. I'll link to that in the description. And also later, an audio version will probably be posted on SoundCloud. That seems to be her team's sort of regular practice. A few days later, they'll put it on SoundCloud. So that was a great pleasure. And coming off of that, I'd like to maybe address a couple things that we didn't have time to get to and maybe elaborate, go back, revisit and elaborate on a few things that I did talk about. But first, I will just note, as of this moment, I now have well over 200 patrons, which is a big goal that I've been looking forward to. So I'm very happy to say that. Hopefully it seems that number will hold even if a few people get declined as happens every month. And so I will go forward with engaging with a producer. As I've mentioned before, I've already talked to someone who's one possibility and even if that doesn't end up working out, uh, I'll go, I'll keep on that because, you know, as promised, I want to try reaching out and experimenting with things like videos or live lectures or lectures dealing with music, which I think would be just a really great way to use this medium, but it's practically and legally complicated. And also before I get into the events of this year and the history behind them, I will say that this year in review is sponsored by the letter A, and I will explain later what that means. Now, several things that I've been thinking about a lot and trying to put into context include the recent disputes over Twitter and the takeover of Twitter and fears of censorship and suppression. Also, the dispute over the railroads and the position of the unions in their attempt to get better pay and better treatment and working conditions, particularly sick days, which flared up and then was basically stamped out this autumn. But lest we forget, you know, something else that came up in the news, of course, this year was the overturning of the Roe versus Wade precedent in the Dobbs decision by the Supreme Court. And that's something I have not talked about a lot. I have not researched the modern anti-abortion movement in particular, so I won't comment on it a lot, but I will note a couple of things. Last year, I posted a lecture about the Powell Memo from 1971, because it was the 50th anniversary of this document written by a lawyer for the tobacco industry, Lewis Powell, which really helped to launch the modern conservative political movement, the sort of fundraising, lobbying, and campaign funding machine that in a way underpins the Republican Party and also has spilled over and been mimicked to some degree in the Democratic Party as well, and in this way has come to kind of characterize all of American politics. But I more or less made the argument that there has been a long-term, decades-long concerted movement to protect what Lewis Powell referred to as the free enterprise system or the American economic system against regulation, reform, and against enemies such as Ralph Nader, who he saw as kind of the great enemy of American free enterprise. And I argued that this has been a long-term, fairly effective movement. 
And one of its major targets came to be the court system. And you could especially see that shift happen because Lewis Powell himself, who wrote this impactful memo for the Chamber of Commerce, was then shortly after, just a few months later, appointed to the Supreme Court himself. And he became a Supreme Court justice, and he played a key role in Supreme Court decisions such as Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, which established the idea that spending money is a form of speech that is then protected under the First Amendment, which arguably then sort of opened the gateways to more and more use of money and, and just brute financial power to influence the political process, and then ultimately further through organs like the Federalist Society to influence the character and makeup of the judiciary. And further, finally, that the conservative social movement, including the anti-abortion movement, was sort of uh, linked up as a, a kind of second factor, a second force into this long-term conservative movement. And that the fiscal conservative wing and the social conservative wing did not always have the same priorities. In some ways, it was sort of uh, odd bedfellows, but they were woven together partly through the philosophy of fusionism, this school of thought, conservative thought in the 60s and 70s, which tried to create a sort of marriage or partnership of fiscal conservatism and social conservatism. And I pointed out that the fiscal conservative side of this movement, which calls for deregulation, privatization, the undermining of the ability of unions to organize or collect dues, this side has achieved much more successes and results in the judiciary arena than the social conservative side. And I noted that, as I said in that lecture about a year ago, I said the Roe versus Wade precedent may very well be overturned soon. That is a total possibility. But nonetheless, it's significant that it has taken so much longer than these more money and economic focused judicial decisions like Buckley versus Vallejo, which then was followed up by Citizens United and McCutcheon versus FEC and so forth, all of which preceded this sort of coming to fruition of the anti-abortion movement in this Dobbs ruling this year. So that's just my sort of perspective on the historical forces that led to this moment. And as I said, I have not studied the anti-abortion movement in depth, and I have not studied the history of abortion rights. But you may know that the history behind both of those issues came to the fore in the public furor this summer, over the Dobbs ruling when the draft decision was leaked and then when it was being argued and when the ruling was handed down. A question that came to be at issue was the historical question of whether there was a right to abortion before the mid-19th century. So if one looks at the legality of abortion, there's a sort of turning point in the mid-1800s when many states started to outlaw abortion, some of them completely outright at any stage of pregnancy, some only at later stages of pregnancy. And that's all pretty well documented. What's a lot more unclear and ambiguous is, well, what was the status quo before that point? What, how did people view abortion in the colonial era, the 18th century, the early 19th century? And some people might say, totally understandably might say, who cares? <laughs> that's ancient history. We don't see things. We don't do things the same way anymore. Why should that be at issue? But it is at issue because it was a factor in the Roe versus Wade decision. One of the arguments advanced in court and in the ruling was that previous to that point in the mid-19th century, abortion had not been understood to be a crime. It was something that women did often with the help of midwives or folk healers using abortifacients or other strategies. People terminated abortions routinely, and it was only many years later that it came to be labeled as a crime due to a campaign largely by doctors who were trying to sort of wrest control over health care and reproductive medicine away from these midwives and sort of unlicensed healers and bring it under the control of a formalized profession. It's not that simple either, though. And in a sense, we have a sort of weird glass half full, glass half empty situation because 
It is not the case that anyone in the colonial age or the early republic said women have the right to practice abortion. Rather, they said if a woman is to be accused of the misdemeanor of abortion, it only counts if it happened after the point of quickening, which can be defined as the point where a fetal heartbeat can be detected or fetal movement. And that was perceived as the point in time when the developing pregnancy becomes a fetus or the the forerunner of an infant. Prior to that, it was considered just a fertilized pregnancy that was only a potential life and not an actual life. So the broad understanding throughout, basically throughout Anglo-America in that age was if it is before quickening, it is not in any way a criminal matter. It is something for the pregnant woman to work out, and she can take medicines or potions or whatever that she thinks will stop the pregnancy, and that is her business. After quickening, it can become a legal matter, but even then it was only a misdemeanor. It was not considered a criminal offense, and it was very rarely prosecuted. And probably part of why it was so rarely prosecuted was because how could you show that quickening had happened? Who could demonstrate that other than the pregnant woman herself, right? So it was really, even though there were technically laws or precedents in states prohibiting abortion after that point, nonetheless, they were basically unenforceable. And it wasn't until the mid-19th century that this movement came about to just try to categorize all abortion as such as a crime. And part of why they went about it that way was because it was proving that a woman was pregnant seemed more feasible than proving whether or not quickening had happened. So you could take this a number of different ways, right? On the one hand, you could say, see early abortion before quickening, which tended to be about four or five months into the pregnancy. Before that point, there was no established history of treating abortion as a crime. Therefore, one can dispel this idea that abortion has traditionally been considered a crime as such, or that it was traditionally considered that life began at conception. So that's fair enough as far as it goes. But on the other hand, you could say, yeah, but after quickening, it was treated as illegal. It was prohibited in Anglo-American society. And going back in Western society even earlier. There is a history of seeing abortion after a certain stage as a crime. So you can look at it either way, right? It just depends in that sense on which side you look at. And in a way, there has been this historical debate back and forth. And I will link to a couple of good articles that discuss this this history and this evolving But you can use history in this way either way, right, to argue either side of this point. You have Alito and the sources, the arguments he's drawing upon, and then abortion rights advocates, both invoking history and in many cases invoking the exact same history, but using it to advance an opposite line of argument, right? Something that happens over and over again, right? One tries to take events and practices from history and fit them into the terms and the debates that we are invested in today. But again, I'll link to a couple of articles that explore that in more detail, reconstruct more of these facts and nuances than I can right now. Now, meanwhile, there are four other main topics that I was able to talk about a bit on the Katie Halper show all of which I thought were interesting and significant, including the dispute over rail workers, the furor that's erupted around Twitter and the so-called Twitter files, the passing of Queen Elizabeth and accession of Charles as Charles III, and, of course, the international tension and standoff around the war in Ukraine. Now, a couple of these I won't get into too deeply. For one thing, As for the changeover in the British monarchy, I commented on that a little bit with Katie, but I don't want to get into it too much now again because I've talked about it before. I talked about it last year in my conversation with Michael about the crisis around Harry and Meghan or the the Sussexes as they might be called. And also just a few weeks ago 
in my interview with Tobias Harper, who wrote about the British honors system and how it serves as a way for the monarchy to mold and influence society using kind of symbolic and soft power, which is very important today, especially as actual state services and functions are cut back in Great Britain. So just in brief, you know, with the passing of the queen, if you take her as kind of embodying this very dignified and innocuous image of monarchy, this kind of very polite and relatively uncontroversial old lady, now that she's been replaced by her son, who is, for one thing, a man who has had many scandals in his history, who may not have the kind of finesse with the public or with the media that Queen Elizabeth did, a lot of lingering questions and antagonisms that may have been kept at bay for many years are likely to come forth again. There's already been much talk about the possibility of Jamaica, Australia, other nations may be removing the British monarch as their head of state. And of course, there's the perennial question of whether the monarchy should be abolished altogether within the United Kingdom. And that question is likely to grow and not go away. But basically, if you if you say the queen was sort of a, a good face, a good poster child for modern monarchy, with her passing, in a way, you have to say that all of the old central institutions that have been taken to unite and create cohesion, both in, in the British Commonwealth, this sort of weird post-empire empire, and even within the United Kingdom itself, among the different classes and the different regions between England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, these sort of institutions have now basically all gone, right? With the passing of Elizabeth, they've lost this connection to the Second World War generation and to that legacy of empire, industry, the Protestant church, and the crown, these main symbols that kind of kept this union uh, stitched together. And I've referred before to, to Linda Colley and her argument in Britons that you know England and Scotland especially are very different societies with different national histories and symbols, but it was commitment, really shared commitment first to Protestantism and then to industry and the empire, all of which were then symbolized by the monarch, that have kept those countries together. And as those institutions have all now faded with decolonization, deindustrialization, and secularization, declining attachment to the Protestant religion, with all of those things now kind of receding, it's likely that the question of the union is only going to become more pressing. The internal government of Scotland has now openly called for another referendum on independence, which is fairly surprising in a way because in polls it's still a very close question. There's no, there's no data showing that the pro-independent side would definitely win if a referendum happened right now. But maybe they are calling for that at this point strategically because they know that Westminster will put their foot down and say no. And the new prime minister, you know, the, the sort of fourth of four prime ministers just within the past few years, Rishi Sunak has said no. And so you could see a constitutional crisis in the offing there. But then even putting the question of the union aside, one can see the crises over labor, over austerity, the long years of cutting social services, the renewed uh, waves of strikes and labor militancy, and really the dysfunction and division with the, even within the main national parties. If you put aside the independence movement in Scotland, the rising republicanism in Northern Ireland, the increasing sentiment that Northern Ireland should join the republic, even putting that aside, if you take these sort of main long-standing pillars of British politics in Westminster, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, both of them were already deeply divided, were divided by the Brexit question, which was a cross-cutting issue, and now seem in a way to be kind of unable to govern, right? Maybe maybe the Labour Party under Keir Starmer could plausibly uh, come to power and form a functional government, but they just won't be able to do so until there's a general election, and the Conservative Party won't do that. The Conservative Party is riven by contending factions, by lack of a clear leader, 
and now seem to be just sort of cycling through prime ministers and tossing them out one after another. So really, in a way, you could say the whole British state seems to be coming apart at the seams as, again, as these kind of central focal points of the British identity and the British power system are outmoded. Okay, so other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the theater? Well, I'll just briefly mention some things that I was able to discuss the other day, such as the outbreak of war in Ukraine. And I won't get deeply into that. Obviously, there are very strong convictions on this issue. People are very attached to the cause of Ukraine, whom they see as representing democracy and the free world, and which is under attack by an authoritarian neighbor. And, you know, all of those feelings and views, of course, are valid. But considering that I had just been starting to research into the roots of World War I in the fall of 2021, just as this potential war seemed to be arising on the distant horizon in early 2022, there were a lot of kind of alarming resonances, right, of people feeling obligated to rally to the defense of a smaller state that is under attack in Eastern Europe, a feeling of obligation as a matter of honor that one has to step in and support one's smaller allies, which happened to all parties at the beginning of World War I in 1914, where Russia feels that they must step in and defend Serbia. Germany feels that they must back up Austria-Hungary. And although no one wants a massive global conflagration, nonetheless, this sense of commitment and obligation ended up pulling in one player after another after another until it became a massive world war. And the way that people's hearts went out and the way people spoke about Ukraine, to me, for one thing, struck me as remarkably similar to the way people talked about Belgium, that the, the violation of Belgium's neutrality was this terrible atrocity and that Great Britain, for their part, couldn't stand by and allow this to happen. They had to rush to Belgium's aid, which then you know further pulled more players, more arms, more men, more empires into this global fight. And also the way people have spoken about Putin, and I am certainly not going to say anything in defense of Vladimir Putin, but the sort of focus on the personality of Putin and the idea that his psychology, his sort of evil, twisted psychology must be the only explanation for why this war is happening to the exclusion of geopolitical factors, military or economic interests, it is, to me, it was remarkably reminiscent of the way people during the First World War spoke about Kaiser Wilhelm, you know, who also was a bit insane and was a bit of a tyrant, but nonetheless, whose country, Germany, was pushed and pulled by serious economic and military concerns and who got involved and in many ways fueled this enormous world war independent. Of, of Kaiser Wilhelm's wishes. Right? Initially, the Kaiser wanted to keep the peace with his cousin Nikki in Russia. Right? If it had been up to him, it would have been averted. Yet it was other factors that created this massive war in which Germany was sort of right in the, the epicenter. And yet Britons and especially Americans spoke about the war as if it was all just the effect of Kaiser Wilhelm's insane psyche and not the result of massive military and political forces that were beyond the control of any one dictator or tyrant. So regardless of all that, and regardless of the similarities or differences that one might see with World War I, I do hope eventually to, to go back and try a series kind of exploring the actual political and social situation around Europe, especially Eastern Europe, the Middle East, that ended up creating this war, right? And to again, once again, as many others have before, although in my opinion, not terribly well, tackle this question of why did World War I happen? And hopefully to get past this sort of worn debate between determinism, that there was some sort of big force, militarism, capitalism, imperialism that made the war inevitable, and on the other hand, contingency. It was unforeseeable random accidents. It was the Archduke's car stalling on a street corner that allowed him to be assassinated and the dominoes fell from there, right? 
and to maybe sort of seek out some sort of explanation of where that war came from that is not completely wedded to determinism or randomness. So those are both topics that I was able to touch on a bit in my conversation with Katie Halper. Maybe at some point I'll go back to them in the future. But the main things that I really wanted to talk about today are disputes over the power and the role of corporations in American life, which very much echo problems going back to the Gilded Age, to the 19th century, and which you can see as demonstrating that we are sort of living in a new Gilded Age in the sense that we're grappling with a contradiction between this long-standing belief in the market and the ability of market incentives to solve social problems, and on the other hand, shock at the power and the consequences of accumulated power in the hands of corporations and their owners, which we still today sort of have failed to reconcile. So the two instances that stand out that I really wanted to comment on are the controversy over Twitter and the so-called Twitter files coming out in the wake of Elon Musk's takeover and the dispute over railway workers and their conditions of work. So as for the Twitter furor, you know, you can see, I think, a tension and really a contradiction in the way that people are reacting to these ups and downs these changes in Twitter and these revelations of previously private documents from Twitter. So on the one hand, for years, we have been vaguely aware in different ways of Twitter's efforts to control, curtail what happens on their platform, which private investors owned and launched and which employees managed and designed. And as claims and arguments have come out about people being banned from Twitter, you know, Donald Trump, of course, is the most famous case. There, there's Alex Jones, many others, also many minor users, reporters, commentators have been suspended or banned at various times. And a common refrain that you would hear is, that is okay because it's a private company, right? The First Amendment doesn't apply. There's no freedom of speech or freedom of the press on Twitter. It's a private company. They can ban or censor whatever they want. And legally speaking, that is true. But then on the other hand, as Elon Musk has taken control of the company this year, there's been alarm and consternation of what is this going to mean about hate speech or conspiracy theories or freedom of speech, basically freedom of expression. And some of the same people who maybe brushed this issue off previously are then suddenly alarmed and concerned when, let's say, journalists who criticize Elon Musk are banned from Twitter. And so there's a conflict here, a deep conflict between seeing Twitter as a public forum and as a sort of necessary avenue for free speech, free exchange of ideas. And on the other hand, putting it at arm's length as just a private company that can do whatever they want, including censor certain people's speech or ban certain people from using it at all. And this sort of tension and conflict really has existed for years with regard to all the big internet platforms, right? Google, Facebook, Amazon, all of these corporations now have tremendous power to guide or even control who can communicate with whom, who can say what to whom, who can conduct business on the internet. There's been very little regulation, very little intervention. There's been no move to break any of these companies up as monopolies, even when you see the tremendous concentrated power of, say, Google or Amazon. It's all been sort of allowed to develop. There is no sort of discussion of applying a general standard of freedom of speech or privacy to these big platforms. And we know that the very business model of most of these businesses, including Twitter, Facebook, and Google, is collecting, using, and selling data from the users. So there's an unresolved conflict here that maybe is only coming out into the open now that you have someone who's as outspoken, or maybe you could say as much of a loose cannon as Elon Musk, very ostentatiously taking over Twitter, redirecting its moderation or suppression of speech, and exposing these private files, which are significant mainly in that 
they're showing the previously hidden sort of backdoor relationship between Twitter and the state, right, where you can see state agents in agencies like the FBI routinely combing through Twitter and every day even contacting Twitter and making requests to ban an account, suppress an account, take down certain tweets, and in a way sort of shape the limits of the discourse that happens on Twitter. So there's been this very close relationship, maybe not always friendly and not always totally cooperative, but a very close relationship between Twitter and the state, whereby people can be censored at the behest of state actors. And yet, because at the same time, it's a private company, it allows this sort of workaround, this kind of plausible deniability, that it's not the state taking away someone's freedom of speech or privacy, it's a private company, and hence they have a sort of free hand. And this kind of bargain, which, as I said, is it rests on this sort of contradiction about what exactly is Twitter and what is its role. This has a long precedent going back to the 19th century and at the very least to the telegraph. So the U.S. Constitution mandates that the federal government shall run a post office to facilitate communication, the exchange of messages and goods among the citizenry at large. And from the beginning, the post office was understood to be subject to the requirements of the Bill of Rights. People have freedom of speech, they can exchange messages and ideas freely by post, and the Fourth Amendment, the, they have the right to keep those messages private as much as they want. Postal workers can't just open people's mail, and even the fact that people are exchanging mail is private unless the state has probable cause and a warrant to monitor people's mail. But in general, it's understood by default to be subject to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the right to no unreasonable search and seizure. Now, a few decades later, when electronic communication first started to come around, beginning with the telegraph, many people assumed, including Samuel F.B. Morse himself, who invented the telegraph, assumed that it would fall under the purview of the post office and that the government would take up this technology and create a public telegraphic service for people to exchange messages and information the same as they do by mail. But that didn't happen. Instead, what happened is that after much campaigning and coaxing by Morse and his allies, Congress did agree to appropriate money just to build an initial experimental telegraph line between Washington and Baltimore. And once they had put in that initial investment to sort of prove that this was a viable technology, they then left it to the private market to build and use this system for profit. And pretty quickly, after just a few years, the whole system was taken over by a monopoly, which was Western Union, under the ownership of the Vanderbilt family. And Western Union had the power to charge whatever rates they wanted, and they gouged the public in many people's views using this monopolistic control of this technology. They also controlled who could use the telegraph and restricted what they could say. So they formed a partnership with the monopolistic cartel of news reporting, AP, or the Associated Press, and they made a bargain with AP where they said, no reporters and no newspapers who aren't part of AP are allowed to use the telegraph. Only AP. They have an exclusive deal. And part of the bargain was that in return, AP had to promise not to publish any arguments or ideas or information against Western Union. They had to completely suppress any speech or commentary criticizing Western Union and its monopoly power. So even though movements did come up from time to time, including the populist movement, that called for either breaking up Western Union or, in the populist's case, creating a public telegraph system that would be open to all and would have freedom of speech like the post office, these were always squelched by the power of Western Union and AP and their alliance. Now, furthermore, Western Union, in order to maintain this monopoly chokehold on the flow of ideas and information, they had to make a bargain with the state as well. They had to somehow stop either major party 
from trying to reform the system, break up the monopoly, regulate the monopoly, or introduce a public competitor. And in order to do that, they basically used the information power they had to bribe politicians. So on the one hand, they could, again, control what was reported in news media and suppress criticism of their favored politicians. But even more importantly, they had no duty to respect the privacy of telegraphic messages. And so they could secretly tap in and spy on people's telegraphic communications. And you can imagine they might use this for blackmail, but particularly they used it as a form of political bribery. So they could look in at people's telegraphic messages and their telegrams and then collect them and hand over the politically sensitive ones to their political allies for them to then use to their advantage. And there are cases of this happening in the 1870s, perhaps most significantly in the disputed election of 1876, where the electoral vote was in doubt and it was unclear for weeks whether the Democrat or the Republican had won. And basically, Western Union's main allies and defenders in Congress were Republicans. So Western Union officials, including even the president of the company, simply looked at the Democrats' communications about the information they had, about their strategy, and handed them over to their Republican friends in Congress. And in this way, they could always maintain sort of protectors and patrons in government. And this really set a precedent, right? It, it set a precedent of a certain kind of bargain between monopolistic media companies and the state, where the state itself couldn't, it, it, it was very difficult for them to get away with actually spying directly on communications over electronic media and using them because they could be exposed and it was a violation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But as long as they protected a private company, a private corporation's ownership over those media, then they had this sort of backdoor channel where the private company could spy, could use its ability to surveil politicians, dissenters, journalists, and furthermore could set limits and censor who was able to use those media at the be even at the behest of the state. But the state would have this sort of one degree of plausible deniability that it's not us, it's a private entity, so the Bill of Rights doesn't apply. And this sort of precedent then continued to hold in later eras when you had broadcast media. But in a way, broadcast media were much simpler, right? There was no understanding of privacy. It was publicly broadcast. But it came out of central nodes, right? The, the signals came out from a point, a central point, and were shared out to a viewing or listening area. And so it was relatively easy then for the state to monitor directly, right? So there didn't have to be the same kind of backdoor bargain the way there was with the telegraph. But then when the internet comes along, the internet is not a broadcast medium. Rather, in terms of its structure and functions, it's much more similar to the telegraph. So a lot of the same sort of anxieties about dissenting opinions or false disinformation being disseminated and the state's sort of anxiety, how are we going to surveil and control this uncontrollable medium, came up again in recent years, much like in the age of the telegraph. And in a lot of ways, the development of the internet has been remarkably similar, a remarkably close echo, where the technology was given its initial test run by the state, right? It was created by DARPA in the, the Defense Department, or, you know, by Al Gore, if you want to go with that version of the story. But it was a state project once it had been demonstrated that it had this, these capabilities and potentials, it then basically was just unleashed out onto the private market, where then private corporations created the system, you know, in terms of both internet service providers, which actually run the cables and bring the transmission lines into homes and businesses, and then also big platforms that manage communication, whether buying and selling of goods like on Amazon, or social communication like 
Facebook or public commentary and reporting like on Twitter. In these different ways, private companies have been able to corner these markets and create monopolies. And the same sort of bargain happens now, you know, and now we even have antitrust laws. And yet, again, they're not enforced on these internet companies. And the understanding basically is that the state it seems from what we're seeing bit by bit from scandals and controversies around Facebook and now the Twitter files, what we're seeing is a similar bargain that seems to have taken shape, whether consciously or not, which is that the state will not act against these companies by trying to break them up or create public rivals that are operated at cost like the post office or take them over and make them public services. They won't do any of those things. They won't even talk about those possibilities if in return those companies allow the state special privileged access to data, to backdoor information about how the platforms are being used, and if those platforms will cooperate with the state in terms of censoring or suppressing speech that state actors consider dangerous. So in all of these ways, I think we're seeing a remarkable repetition where this Gilded Age precedent that was set in the age of the telegraph is now being repeated. Whether the people who have worked out this arrangement are conscious of it or not, the public seems to be totally unaware of how this precedent came about. And there is precedent even in the strict legal sense that there was a court case in the 1870s that went all the way to the Supreme Court, where it ultimately was found that Western Union had the right to censor whatever they wanted, read whatever they wanted. There was no right to privacy on telegrams sent over privately owned telegraph wires. And I think that if these fears and anxieties now about control of the internet are ever going to be resolved, that legal precedent itself will ultimately have to be tackled, whether by trying to overturn it or by simply skirting around it by making these big platforms into public services that can be operated at cost so they're affordable to the public and that are subject to basic constitutional protections. And as I said to Katie, this is not a partisan issue. You know, certainly many of the accounts that we've seen suppressed or banned have been right wing, but also many are not. Dissenters of all sorts, all stripes, many left wing voices such as World Socialist website. And probably if you were to count, probably numerically the number one reason that people have been banned, censored, suppressed on all sorts of platforms and in all kinds of venues in American society is speaking up for Palestinian rights. So this is not a question of left or right. It's a question of who has the power and authority to decide the limits of speech. Okay, and the last issue from this year that I'd like to talk about that I think really continues from the crises and dilemmas of the Gilded Age is this conflict over labor on the railways. And many others have reported about the very dangerous trying conditions that rail workers have been put under and how basically their request for just a few paid sick days off was thwarted by government intervention. Now, a lot of this has been powerful reporting, but it leaves out, I think, the much bigger context that this conflict is really the convergence of two forces and two processes that go back more than 100 years. One of them is just the special importance of labor on the railroads and the struggle of the state to ensure that workers keep the rails running and the fear that if a strike takes place on the rails, it could lead to a rolling disaster throughout the whole economy, not just an economic slowdown, but a general strike. And the other process is the renegotiation of bargains that are struck during times of crisis, like wars and pandemics. We're still really coming out of the pandemic. It still has had this deep impact on workforces like the rail workers 
whose numbers have been reduced, whose hours have been expanded, who are exposed to new dangers and risks of infection or injury. This is really, in a lot of ways, a repetition of the same sort of struggles that have broken out in the wake of previous disasters like the First World War and the Spanish flu 100 years ago. And this conflict, I think, underlines something that I pointed out back in 2020, which is the sort of perverse double meaning of this phrase, essential workers. Right? As I said, various workers in healthcare, transit, food service were labeled during the pandemic as essential workers. But I questioned, what exactly does that mean? Are they essential in the sense that their importance entitles them to good treatment, safety protections, better pay, compensation? It seemed as if none of that applied here. And instead, essential was used just to mean that they can be forced to keep working, right? regardless of the conditions that they're put under. The state can simply make them keep going to work. And so that seems to have been confirmed, I think, in this decision to simply impose a contract on the workers with no sick days, which they had already democratically voted to reject. Now, to go back, this central importance of labor on the rails has really been a live issue, and both employers and the state have been very much aware of that critical juncture, really since, again, since the Gilded Age. Safety has always been a major struggle for rail workers, and working on the rails tends to be inherently dangerous, and it gets worse as staff numbers are reduced. And you can see that in the mid-19th century, when the rails first became the sort of central crucial infrastructure of trade and travel around the country, the rate of injury and death among rail workers was astronomical. It seems that in the 1870s, especially when there was a depression in the 1870s, rail carriers cut back the numbers of their staff. And in those years, in the 1870s and 80s, about one out of 20 rail workers died or was debilitated. And that included in particular one out of seven brakemen who maybe had the most dangerous job. So brakemen at that time had to climb up rail cars, turn a hand brake wheel, and then leap over to the next car and do the same thing in order to bring a train to a stop. And naturally, many of them fell, were run over, severely maimed. And this only got worse as numbers were cut back and brakemen more and more were expected to leap across four or five or six cars and do this repeatedly. And there was a sort of mentality on, on the railroad companies that they could just hire these low-wage workers, use them up until they'd been severely injured, debilitated, and then replace them. And this went on at least until little by little some safety protect protections were instituted. So air brakes were available at this time in the 1870s and 80s, but rail companies preferred to just use cheap labor rather than this basic technology. And only in 1893 was a safety bill enacted which required railways to put in air brakes. So this was the kind of crucible, you know, the, the sense of, of danger, of frustration that was already building among rail workers up until 1877, when the really the first nationwide strike in American history broke out, which began from the railroads. And this was a huge upheaval that really threatened the functioning of society as a whole, but it was unplanned and spontaneous. So how did this happen? Well, in July 1877, the strike was first triggered when four railway companies actually met together, right, operating as a cartel in a way that would technically be illegal today, but there was no law against it then. These four rail company executives met and mutually agreed to cut the wages in tandem all across the industry. So B&O Railroad announced a 10% cut in wages, and this led workers at their stations and rail yards in West Virginia to walk out and begin to picket. And it spread very fast. So first eastward to Baltimore, where workers in the big roundhouse went out on strike, and this was a crucial link between the East Coast industries and the West. Then further to Philadelphia, New York City, and 
also north to Pittsburgh, and then west across the Midwest to Chicago and St. Louis, all within a few days, less than a week. And then finally, all the way along the Transcontinental Railroad to San Francisco in about two weeks. So within two weeks, this had become a nationwide strike, bringing almost the whole rail system to a standstill and hence really threatening the whole economic structure of the country. And even in the midst of this, employers refused to budge or negotiate. So riots began attacking and torching rail stations and rail yards, especially in Baltimore, beginning again with the B&O Railroad. Very few trains could leave the station anywhere in the country. And then as the halt in transport affected other industries, the workers in many of those other industries joined in with the marches and pickets and joined the strike. So dock workers and iron workers quickly joined. In Buffalo, it seems that hundreds of people were arrested, rioting and picketing, including stonemasons, blacksmiths, and even low-level white-collar workers like clerks and small merchants and shopkeepers. So it was crossing beyond just the population of railroad workers to a sort of broad class spectrum. And there was tremendous alarm and consternation, naturally. And for example, the newspaper, the St. Louis Republic, printed, quote, it is wrong to call this a strike. It is a labor revolution. So people feared that society was being overturned here. And the president, Rutherford B. Hayes, who had managed to finagle a win out of that disputed election in 1876, he now in office calls this rolling strike an insurrection, despite it not being aimed at government per se, but at private companies. He calls it an insurrection and uses presidential power to call in the army to get the trains running again at all costs. So ultimately, state power, as embodied by force of arms, is invoked. And the army in several places, especially in Baltimore, had to forcibly fight their way through crowds They fought their way into the roundhouse and fired at the rioters, killing nine people. And this only further inflamed the anger across much of the country. And crowds and marchers in Chicago fought with police, destroyed two locomotives. The newspapers in Chicago basically railed against these strikers and, you know, called them anarchists and advocated for the use of grenades and explosive to to disperse the mobs. And it took weeks to quell this event. And in fact, Hayes had to call back five military units out of the Indian wars that were being fought in the Dakota Territory into Chicago. And interestingly, many opponents and critics of the strikers actually labeled them as violent savages like the Indians. So in a way, it was seen as almost... The the frontier wars against the, the Indian nations was coming back into the cities in the form of this strike. And the governor of Pennsylvania called in the state militia, brought them into Pittsburgh, because local police and militias from around the city were too sympathetic to the strikers. The state militia fired rifles into crowds, killing 25 people. And nonetheless, rioters continued to torch railway stations and warehouses. And in total, over the course of the strike, 45 people were killed. Yet nonetheless, of course, despite that, politicians and the press portrayed the workers as bloodthirsty savages, right? Not the governors or the police or the and militias who had actually shot people. Instead, it was the workers who were bloodthirsty savages. And many claimed that the whole uprising was driven by communism or other sort of subversive ideologies. But ultimately, the lesson of the strike to the elites really was that it demonstrated that an interconnected working class linked by the railways, right? You had these workers moving back and forth city to city every day. This working mass and even lower middle class linked together by the rails, could bring society to a halt almost instantly. And hence, this workforce, especially most of all, had to be controlled with police, with militias, and with armies. And this basic precedent has held and has gotten sort of legal articulation and elaboration, more or less affirming the principle that state power can be used to keep the rails running.
Now, nonetheless, many workers did organize and push back as best they could, and it did have some results. So by 1914, a lot of the rail workforce was unionized. There were craft unions affiliated with the AFL and more radical unions associated with the IWW. And so this was in place then by the time World War I broke out and then the U.S. got involved in World War I directly in 1917. So a crisis like the First World War really pushed the governing bodies and the corporate elite of the United States against the wall. World War I, of course, was a total war, and massive numbers of people, weapons, ships had to be launched across the Atlantic in order for the U.S. to intervene effectively. And they had now, of course, declared war on major powers like Germany that had a submarine fleet and enormous industrial capabilities. So they absolutely had to keep these war materials moving. And so they had to keep the rails running no matter what. And they knew that the workers on the railroads had to cooperate with this effort. And if they struck or walked out, the whole thing, the whole system could collapse. And it was not clear to what degree the working class was, would be willing to take part in the war effort. And you know the IWW was categorically against U.S. involvement in the war. So the state, together with the corporate managers, had to go to the workers and work out a deal to secure the situation. As the beginning of this arrangement, the government actually took direct control of the railways through the U.S. Railroad Administration. So they sort of took up stewardship of the whole rail system. Some of the private corporations objected to this and went to court. But a court case, Wilson v. New, concluded that the government could take over control of the rails if it wanted to, not necessarily as war powers, but because of the Interstate Commerce Clause. So the court concluded that rails were so critical to the whole conduct of interstate commerce that the government could simply take them over and run them as it chose if it decided that was necessary. So the U.S. Railroad Administration takes up the whole system and they offer certain guarantees. They go to these unions and they offer certain guarantees. Firstly, the right to organize and recruit through the war. They guarantee an eight-hour workday, so reasonable hours, certain safety precautions and standards, and they use the phrase living wage. They promise that they will make the private owners of these railways pay an acceptable wage that that workers could actually live on. And this wage would be set by a, at least in theory, an independent mediation board. And they also guaranteed equal pay for women. So with the mass mobilization of men into the armed forces, a lot of women were stepping more and more into industrial and managerial jobs, and they guaranteed equal pay for male and female workers. Now, in return, as part of this bargain, in return, the labor unions had to make certain promises. They had to promise not to strike or walk out or to in any way protest or hinder the war effort. And they allowed the government to claim the right to use force to keep the trains running. This power to intervene had already been legally established by the Wilson versus New case, and the unions agreed to respect this new authority. So this bargain basically held through 1918 until shortly after the end of the war. But then in 1919, now that the crisis is no longer happening, the state, not surprisingly, tried to revise the bargain. So they, the Railway Administration for firstly rescinded all of its promises to labor. As far as hours, safety conditions, living wage, they basically said, we're handing all of that back to the private corporations and you're at their mercy, at the mercy of the market. And the government went through a similar process with all kinds of other industries at the same time. And this led to a massive wave of strikes in 1919. There was a huge steel strike in the steel industry, which failed. There was a general strike across industries in Seattle, the first sort of planned, coordinated general strike in the country, which also failed. 
But here you can see a pattern that I referred to earlier, right? That in moments of crisis, when it's seen as absolutely necessary, the state will strike a bargain with workers. But then once the crisis is over, they'll want to re renegotiate or simply renege and say, we're not honoring our side of the bargain anymore, but we still retain our right and power to make you keep working, right? They want to have their cake and eat it too. And this is the same sort of thing that's happened many times after many crises. And in this case, it was exacerbated even further by the Spanish flu and the fact that so many workers were either dying or severely ill. And so the workforce was being reduced and shrunken down, and those that were left were being pushed to work for longer and longer hours under more and more strenuous conditions. So not surprisingly, there was a sort of rolling wave of multiple strikes in 1919. But in the, in the rails, it was delayed a little longer. The Railway Administration remained in place until 1920, until it was finally closed, and complete control of the industry was handed back to private companies. All of those guarantees, as I said, were rescinded. And furthermore, the government approved cuts to the workers' pay. So using this last sort of remaining statutory authority, they signed off and gave permission for broad pay cuts and the elimination of overtime pay. And this was in a context also of inflation. So with these reduced wages, it became even more impossible to survive considering price inflation, which had begun during the war, right? This is normal during wartime to have wartime inflation. Your industrial output has grown. You have this massive workforce that's being paid, but not much of what's being produced is consumer products going onto the consumer market. A lot of it is weapons, ships, bombs that are being shipped off somewhere else to the war front. And so what you, what you end up with is a lot of money in circulation, but not an increase in consumer goods, and so the prices go up. So you have inflation, which then continues for several years after the war in conjunction with this reduced uh, workforce, and workers arguably were overstrained to the breaking point. So in 1922, the railway shopmen, which were specifically the sort of maintenance workers on the trains, called a strike. The general workforce at large was divided over whether this strike was advisable or advantageous and whether it would even be able be viable because it was technically illegal, right? These, these guarantees still held in some sense that they would keep working. So some other groups of workers stayed on the job. In other places, scabs were brought in as temporary replacements to the workers who were on strike. The mediation board which was still in place, even though the railway administration had been dissolved. This mediation board called the strike illegal, and the Harding administration then went to court and asked for an injunction, enabling them to stop the strike forcibly. And a district judge delivered an injunction that was a shockingly broad decree, even at the time, a broad decree banning picketing, banning strike meetings, banning the spending of any strike funds to support the strike, prohibiting leaders from issuing any directions to workers or public statements to the press, and furthermore, even issuing a, a sort of universal gag order prohibiting anyone in the country from making any statements in print or by telephone supporting the strike. So a sort of broad abrogation of freedom of speech, of assembly, and of the press. And many people saw this injunction as going too far, and there was a political backlash against it. But nonetheless, the private companies, with their partners and, and allies in the media, they were able to gradually turn most of the public against the strikers. Firstly, by associating them with the Russian Revolution and saying that they are Bolsheviks, they're trying to spread Bolshevism and communism to America. And secondly, by blaming inflation on the workers, which, you know, maybe should sound familiar, right? The idea that unions and their demands for better wages were the cause of inflation, which was in affecting everybody. So the strike collapsed after a few more weeks by the end of 1922, and this failure was a significant blow for organized labor in the 20s. 
Now, there was a complicated upshot, though, in the sense that unions still did have the formal right to bargain collectively. And that was further than enshrined by the Railway Labor Act of 1926, which gave certain protections and said railway workers can unionize, they can recruit, they can negotiate and bargain collectively with employers. But in order to try to avert strikes, they had to go through a very long, complicated mediation process involving this government-appointed mediation board. And only after that whole process had been exhausted and every attempt had failed to come to a contract agreement, then they had a limited right to strike. And the particular unions whose wages or hours were at issue had the right to strike, but they didn't have the right to sympathy strike, so they couldn't all walk out together in mutual support. It had to be only limited strikes. So in a sense, this right to strike, you could say, in a way, had been restored, at least legally, formally speaking, under this Railway Act. But nonetheless, this ruling in Wilson v. New still stood. There was still this clear judicial precedent saying that if the state wants to, they can just step in and force whatever contract they want on the workers and prohibit them from striking just like had been done with this injunction in 1922. So in a way, the whole Railway Labor Act, although it was very elaborate and it, you know, it aimed at somehow finding mediation and agreement between employers and workers, it really was a dead letter, right? The real bottom line was the state claims the right to make railway workers work on whatever terms it dictates. So in all of these ways, both in the 1920s and then exactly 100 years later in 2022, you can see the same basic pattern, right? That in times of extreme crisis, the state hashes out a bargain in order to keep crucial industries functioning. This can involve certain guarantees to workers in return for the power to compel them to keep working. Then after the crisis ends, the state reneges on these guarantees, but still keeps that newfound power. In this way, they can have their cake and eat it too. In the current crisis, however, you could say it's even gone a bit of a step further. Because as I observed during the sort of most severe period of the pandemic in 2020, when people were being labeled as essential workers and told that they should keep going to work, the state didn't make any offer. They didn't make any concessions to these workers for why it would be worth their while or even safe for them to keep doing this work. They basically just said, we're telling you to keep working. And maybe you could say there was an implication, a suggestion that at some point down the line, they would get compensated and something about their pay or conditions of work would improve. And when that simply didn't happen in 2021, you saw a similar, albeit smaller, but a somewhat similar wave of strikes, which caught a lot of attention and sort of caught the public imagination. And that's the main thing I talked about last year. But this year, we can see maybe a bit of how that is playing out. And again, how state power is directed and deployed to manage and suppress these sorts of crises. Now, nonetheless, of course, the story is not over. It's never over. We'll see what happens in the coming year. In the meantime, I have to start planning and working out uh, what I'm going to do, what new series of lectures I might work on, and how I might branch out and try new forms, new media. I mentioned the idea of having a series about the roots of World War I. I also posted a Twitter poll, which should still be live until New Year's Eve, about possibilities of big, important subjects that I've had sort of shelved and haven't addressed yet, namely World War I, the French Revolution, and the Vikings. I also have many other ideas. I love doing national and regional histories. I've brought up the possibility of doing more about Scotland or about New Zealand and the Pacific. I also do think sometime later in the spring, I'll do a series about Eastern Africa, and I actually have a person in mind that I might start out with an interview with her. But if you have a Twitter account, you can go and uh, vote in that poll. But otherwise, if you don't, if you like any of those ideas or something else you want to suggest, please comment or message me on Patreon. I'd like to hear from you. 
And I wish everyone, again, happy holidays and a good new year. And finally, as I said before, this year in review commentary is brought to you by the letter A. So my patrons now number over 200, and the list has gotten too long for me to recite without the syllables all just kind of slurring together into nonsense. So instead, what I'm going to do is for today, I'm going to tell you the names of all of my current active patrons whose names begin with A. So thank you to Adam Kath, Adam Hustler, Adil Sharizaye, Adrian Renix, Alex Muller, Alex Wilson, Alyssa Rich Frell, Amandeep Boyer, Ambrose Gilson, Amir Abiri, Amy Stewart, Andrea, Andrew Burek, Andrew Deldono, Andrew Smith, Angelica Falkenstein, Anna Viznitskaya, Anne Crook, Annika Garcia, Anonymous, Asa, Augustus Brassfield, Avi, and Ozzy Elowich. Thank you, and have a good new year.